face the piper's front. Take the short end of the plate in your left hand and pass it over the epaulet. Then from the back, tuck it back underneath the epaulet and pull it through to the front. This will tighten the plate and it will also create the foundation of a rose into which you will ultimately pin the brooch. Six, face the piper's back. Grasp the sides of the plate at the shoulder blade level with both hands. Left edge, left hand, right ha edge, right hand, obviously. Now with a quick movement, cross your hands right over left, thereby twisting the material to reverse the edges. And to further tighten the plate, grasp the right edge of the long end just below the epaulet and give it several gentle tugs towards the center of the back. Seven, still facing the piper's back, take the new left edge of the plate and pass it over the shoulder so that it covers completely. This should result in an equal distribution of the long end, creating a pleasing effect of material cascading over the shoulder and arm of the dressee. Eight, pin the plaid brooch through the gathered material at the shoulder, and the plaid is now complete. The drummer's plaid. I've heard it called by several names, such as the half plaid or belted plaid. Under any of these names, it would identify quite well since it's about half the weight and length of a piper's plaid. It does have a belt and is worn by a drummer. However, as far as the wearer is concerned, it is much more convenient to have someone help you with it rather than struggle on one's own. In an effort to describe the drummer's plaid, it has a narrow belt and buckle attached to a gathered section of material which has been pleated and sewn to a width of approximately eight inches. From this point, the pleats are allowed to fall free before culminating in a second narrower pleated section. This narrower section is the portion of the plaid which drapes over the left shoulder. The edges of the material are fringed and knotted as with the piper's plaid. One. The belt is worn around the waist with the pleated eight inch portion on the left rear hip. At this point, allow the plaid to hang down. Two, over and covering the narrow belt, secure the white drummer's waist belt. Put on the drum sling and sash, if applicable, under the epaulet of the right shoulder. Four, unbutton the left epaulet, then by means of a small loop located on the underside of the narrow pleated or gathered section, secure the plaid to the epaulet button on the left shoulder. The epaulet is then placed over the plaid and rebuttoned. Five, as a precautionary measure, take a medium sized safety pin and affix the plaid to the shirt at about the collarbone level. Be careful to conceal the pin between the folds of the plaid. Six, insert the brooch pin through the plaid at the shoulder level, but only through the gathered portion of the plaid, rather than making unnecessarily large holes in the shirt.
Deportment. The social attractions of belonging to a group such as this are many. The camaraderie, or the developing of the skills required in good piping and drumming, the awareness of Scottish historical and cultural pursuits, and a host of other things. And while individually we all have our own pet agendas, we all enjoy playing to our public. Now this can be in the form of a parade, or a formal Highland Ball, or a less formal but equally important function such as a private country club. One element which is of prime importance is deportment. It's how we look, how we act in public. The definition of the word is behavior, conduct, and image. We need to be well-groomed. Hair length and general tidiness is very important. And so is the close trimming of beards and moustaches. The wearing of personal jewelry, such as neck chains, bracelets, ear and nose rings are quite inappropriate and unacceptable and is vigorously discouraged. We have a heavy responsibility in public relations and as individuals we should at all times conduct ourselves in a gentlemanly fashion and thereby bringing credit not only to ourselves but to the entire unit. Before I demonstrate the basic foot drill I would like to comment on the style or type of drill we use in this unit. The founding members decided that British military drill be used. Since it is very much a part of the historic traditions of a unit such as this, and secondly, it would set us apart from other marching groups in the shrine and be an additional point of interest for our audience. The word attention not only applies to the physical military stance, but also to mental attentiveness and to the art of keeping absolutely still and quiet when brought to that position. Inevitably, someone would choose that moment to impart some piece of meaningless wisdom which has absolutely nothing to do with anything at hand, or fidget and make unnecessary movement, detracting from what otherwise could be a very good performance. When marching on parade, the unit always marches at attention. There is some misguided notion that it is acceptable to march in a relaxed attitude during the periods between play and sets. This is not true. Now to the foot drill. The first position of the basic foot drills would be stand easy. This position is the most relaxed while standing in formation. One may talk, turn or swivel the upper body, but do not move the feet. One may even smoke if permission has been given. A normal standing upright position is adopted with the feet apart, approximately 12 inches between the heels and with the feet at an angle of 45 degrees. This is quite a relaxed position with the weight of the body being evenly distributed across the hips. The at ease position from the stand easy position is a cautionary word of command, prayed or banned. When that command is given, a slight tensing of the body should result and the hands now brought into the rear of the body in that manner. The palm of the left hand holding the back of the right hand with the thumbs crossed. Arms are...